Okay, I think we can get started. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the sixth of eight conversations, which we'll be exploring different perspectives on the subject of waiting. My name is Amara Antilla. I'm senior curator here at the Contemporary Arts Center in Cincinnati. Um, on behalf of the CAC and our co-hosts, the MIT List Visual Arts Center, I'm very happy to welcome Rit Premna and Abby Alpert, who are co-convening this series and are also the co-editors of Shifter Journal, an independent publication exploring the intersection of art, critical theory, and creative writing. The CAC and MIT List are working on two affiliated solo exhibitions featuring Ritz work that will open this fall. These events are being held in the year leading up to the exhibition and also the launch of the next edition of Shifter number 25. Before we get started, I just wanna share some housekeeping notes. Um, first, I'd like to welcome any new attendees, encourage you all to kind of follow us on social media or check out our websites to learn more about the programming here at the CAC and MIT List Center. I also wanna mention that we are recording these sessions so you can view past events on our YouTube channels. Following the presentations, we'll be opening it up for a moderated discussion. So I invite you all to share your questions and comments using Zoom's Q&A feature. And lastly, I hope that you'll all join us for the next event, which is scheduled for February 18th um, with Tavrene Fazeli and Jonathan Van Dyke. So thank you again for being here with us. And now I'll hand it over to Rit and Abby will introduce our presenters and convene the conversation. Um, thank you so much, Amara. Um, I'm Rit Premnath, uh, the co-editor of Shifter with Avi Alpert. Um, so first of all, thanks again to Amara Antilla and um, Natalie Bell, the curators at Contemporary Arts Center Cincinnati and MIT List who um, have uh, been incredible hosts and will continue to be the hosts for the next couple of events. Um, many thanks also to Emily Garner, who does a lot of the organizing at MIT List for these events, and uh, Nick, who is uh, the, the IT person without whom we wouldn't be online and visible and audible to you, and Jamie Pellegrino, who is the, doing live captions today to make this accessible. So thank you so much to all of the people who, who, who allow us to, to be here today. Um, we started this series on waiting um, before, um, in, in fact, before we started thinking about it before the pandemic had, had begun. We'd, we'd been thinking about the way um, waiting affects uh, not just those who are caught in um, oppressive uh, bureaucratic uh, processes in the US and around the world, um, not just um, immigrants caught in um, detention centers uh, trying to cross through the borders, um, but is, is in fact a kind of uh, existential and experiential aspect of all of our lives. And, um, and we really wanted to um, convene a set of dialogues and, and edit a publication that thought through this concept of waiting um, from, a mul from multiple different perspectives and angles. Um, Shifter, as Amara mentioned, is uh, is a publication that um, is um, that that unravels from that unfolds from um, programming. And so this fall, we will uh, launch a new publication, a new issue of Shifter that um, includes all of the discussants over the last um, couple of months and those upcoming, as well as others, to to think through these multiple perspectives on waiting. And of course, now in the context of the pandemic, this has become an even more uh, pertinent um, and issue, something that we're all living through in a variety of ways. And so um, I'm really excited about Matt Metzger and Jane Norris's presentations today that will um, kind of help us think through this notion of waiting um, through the realm of sound. 
um, and um, which will make the Zoom experience, uh, I guess, uh, the, the sound aspect of the Zoom experience even more important. So please make sure to uh, wear your headphones or um, be in a somewhat quiet place to be able to, to listen to them. So again, thank you. And I'm going to pass it on to Avi to introduce our two um, panelists today. Thanks, um, Rit. And, and again, let me just echo Rit's thanks for uh, MIT and CCA to, for all the work that everyone has done to make this possible. And also to Matt Metzger and Jane Naris for joining us today. So just, I'm gonna read the bios. I'll read Matt's first and then he'll speak second and then I'll read Jane's and she will be first. So sort of segue in and then they'll each speak for about 10 to 12 minutes or you know, <laughs> however long works. And then we'll invite them to respond to each other. And please, um, we'll use the, I think as, as Amara said, we'll use the um, Q and A feature uh, to ask questions so you can put those in at any point and we'll, we'll moderate a discussion after. Okay, so Matt Metzger is an artist and educator in Chicago. He received his MFA from the University of Chicago and attended the Skowhegan School uh, Painting and Sculpture Residency Program both in 2009. Metzger is Associate Professor of Studio Art, Studio Art at the University of Illinois at Chicago. His most recent solo exhibitions include Regards, Chicago, Corbett versus Dempsey, Chicago, and Aratia Beer, Berlin. And recent and forthcoming group exhibitions include Retrograde at Logan Center Exhibitions, Chicago, The Freedom Principle at Museum of Contemporary Art, Chicago, and the Institute of Contemporary Art, Philadelphia, and the works at CAB Art Center, Brussels. Currently, he uh, is also preparing a solo exhibition at the Renaissance Society, also in Chicago, titled Heirloom, opening in early June. So if you are in Chicago or perhaps online, you can look forward to that. Uh, and then Jane Norris is Associate Dean at Richmond University in London. She has a cross-disciplinary background in speculative, speculative material design, critical writing, and digital media. Before joining Richmond University, she led a BA honors in 3D design craft for 10 years. She recently undertook postdoctoral research in critical writing at the Royal College of Art. And she's also writing a book, Listening to Materials, Rethinking Our Relationship with Matter, which investigates post-human approaches to making and digital theories of crumpled time. Jane also writes material fiction short stories published in near future fiction anthologies. She has exhibited at the Commonwealth Institute, East London Design Show, 152 Gallery, Whitechapel Open, 1.0 ICA, Triangle Gallery, Chelsea College of Art, The People's Place, Glasgow, Watershed Media Center, Bristol. She has also shown internationally at La Forum, United Nations, Geneva, and Ramoma for the inaugural opening of the New Museum of Modern Art in Nairobi, Kenya. Um, so thanks very much, uh, Matt and Jane, for being here. And I'll look forward to your presentations. Thank you so much. I would like to really thank Rit and Abby for the opportunity to present from London on waiting such an interesting theme at the moment. And thank you also, Nick, for the technical help just now, getting this together. Um, also thank Emily and Natalie at MIT List and Amara at CAC for supporting this excellent series of events. As a designer theorist, my previous work has been focused on materials attending to their properties to remap our material relationships. I've been looking at ways of repairing materials and humans through listening and have been running workshops in galleries and universities on making audio scopes for the infraordinary to listen to specific material sounds pre-COVID-19. But during the first lockdown in the UK in March 2020, the constant hubbub in London died down. Everything became stilled. And in the silence, new sounds flourished. Birds sang as they had never done 
discovering that they could call to each other across long distances. Against a quieter background, sounds became much more distinct. At the same time, during the lockdown, my experience of waiting became more prominent. I was waiting for the lockdown to take effect, waiting for the virus to fade away, waiting to catch the virus, and then having caught the virus, waiting for some time to recover. In the exhaustion of being ill, the only practice I could do was to plant seeds and let them do the creative work. And when I didn't have the energy for that, I would just sit with them, waiting for them to grow and produce, which they did. I moved my focus from materials to plants, and in the silence, my listening shifted too. I started recording the sound of the plant on my desk, a Polysychaeus scutellaria, Polly I call her, an everyday house plant that I bought from Ikea, a home furnishing store, who became my companion as I sat looking out of the window. Here is an early recording with heightened tones at the beginning as I hold one of Polly's leaves. You can hear her settle as the high tone drops. That was Polly playing the clarinet in lockdown. The sound is produced by bioelectrical pulses caused by the plant's circulation drawing water up, which are picked up by audio pads attached to the leaves and connected to a midi sprout. The pulses are made present or hearable to us by relaying them through a midi player, in this case, garage band on my laptop. So very simple equipment. I face the issue of what voice to give Polly. It's often looked down on when we anthropomorphize things. But as Eduardo Conn observes in How Forests Think, by calling something a thing, not a being, we make things killable. Not naming something is a form of premeditated violence. So I gave Polly a female chamber choir voice. This track is a duet between us and again, you can hear the high tones when I hold her leaves, gradually lowering as she adjusts to this. Occasionally, I would leave the connections on Polly, and she would continue to sing all day in the background, mostly quietly, occasionally a little louder. Perhaps she was responding to her own sound. I could walk past the door and hear her without entering. I would listen out for her, waiting to hear how she was.
Sometimes I would leave her singing at night. So listening can perhaps be a form of waiting, waiting with our ears. Maybe listening is the practice of waiting, listening as an active form of waiting. Listening goes much further than hearing. Hearing is our faculty for perceiving sounds where we are told of events, have you heard? But listening is making an effort to hear, anticipating, waiting to hear, to listen out for something. Listening also suggests the dynamic relationship of taking notice and acting on what someone says, responding to advice. They listened, a change in behavior. While I've been waiting to recover from COVID, I've learned to listen to the electrical pulses of Polly. And I came to realize that she has been singing these pulses all along perhaps waiting for me to hear her. It is not that big a jump of thinking of Polly waiting to all plants waiting for us to listen to them. There has been a resurgence in writing on panpsychism by philosophers like Philip Goff, arguing that consciousness is a fundamental and ubiquitous factor of the physical world. Bruce Clark, writing in 2020 on Gaian systems, suggests every autopoetic being perceives some aspect of its environment, however intimate or local, that is crucial to its continuation, and so alters its dwelling. By these modulations of the environment, each also participates in producing what others perceive. Is Polly training me to listen to her? Clark asks, what will happen to evolve a post-Anthropocene Earth? I wonder, what if we were to listen to understand these plant worlds? What if we were to listen to change our behaviour? What would we do? There is the sound of waiting all around us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jane. Um, so much to think about there. Matt, we will pass the torch on to you. Sure. Thanks, Rit. Um, also, thanks, Jane. That was, that was really stellar. I have a lot of questions and curious thoughts as my brain percolates. And uh, it's tough to follow that with what I'm about to follow it with. Um, but uh, first, I just want to make sure also to thank Rit and Avi and Shifter. Uh, I really feel honored and privileged to be involved in this series. Um, and, uh, and also Emily and Amara uh, via MIT List and CAC. Um, it's been great communicating with you guys. And yeah. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing how this night plays out um, also. So uh, I, I would I just want, I have a little bit of a, a, a thing that I'd like to say before I read my presentation, which is 
I just need to make it clear that I am neither a historian um, or an archivist of any kind. Um, and uh, I'm approaching this project through the viewpoint of fundamentally of an artist and um, very much a deep, deep listener of freely improvised music. Um, because I think what I'm about to read might come across as some maybe a uh, provisional attempt at a kind of historical assessment of Steve Lacey's work. And that is not at all what I'm um, after, uh, but we can talk about that later. But I, I just feel like it's important to make that clear. Um, so what I plan to do is I'm gonna read uh, and I'm gonna block myself out so that you guys don't have to look at my concentration face while I read uh, and then I'm going to play two tracks, uh, two brief tracks, um, and I'll make that that clear when that happens. So I'm going to stop my video now. OK. Um, so for years now, I've been interested in the solo improviser, specifically within the field of free music. I'm fascinated by moments in a concert where their history, influence, and tradition become materialized, and perhaps even argued with in public during a concert, as the soloist negotiates obligation with desire. There are, of course, many spaces where one may be able to experience the contentious presence of history in a solo performance, but for me, freely improvised music is a particularly compelling one for its paradox. It is fundamentally tied to the moment, an immediacy with sound that likes to transcend genre and technique in an effort to achieve an intimacy with the now like no other music does. It's a privileging of immediacy over one's hierarchical structures of theory and aesthetics. In a good improvisation, what needs to be played supersedes what can be played. And yet for the soloist, what needs to be played is always constrained by one's own knowledge and traditions, even to the radical moment of an improviser deciding that what needs to be done is to drum on blocks of cheese, thinking about Han Bennett here. So if improvised music is about, let's say, a dialogue between players, where instruments and politics meet each other with respect, curiosity, and feeling in an effort to collectively build something together, then who or what does the solo improviser converse and build with? The audience can only extend so far. And so I have been considering history as the solo improviser's partner. Their training, influence, cultural accents, personal ideologies and even mistakes can become fiercely audible in a concert. The pacing of a phrase, that splat at the end of a scale, the mode of a tune, or the lush vibrato in a syncopated spot that holds one note but not another. Each moment embodies the rituals, education, and psychology of the performer's life. That's what is so interesting the ways one has learned and trained are all on the table to be worked on and worked out consciously. Here, freedom gains compelling traction as the soloist freely improvises with the very systems that both shape and limit creativity. One could argue that it's a reclamation of power. It's not easy to bring to consciousness these systems, much less to play with them, twist them inside out, or shake them to death in real time and space. For many of us, that would take a lifetime of psychoanal psychoanalysis and therapy. Steve Lacey seemed to do this every during every solo and on uh, public display, which brings me to the 1970s and the early days of improvised solo soprano saxophonists, namely both Steve Lacey and Evan Parker. Although I don't intend for this paper to be about or in relation to Evan Parker versus Steve Lacey. I'm only using Evan Parker as an extreme opposite to Steve Lacey. Both of which were pioneers on the instrument and in inventing their own improvisatory lexicon, 
stemming from the influence of Monk and Coltrane and many others the decade before. However, when one listens to Lacey and Parker, <clears throat> there are immense differences in their playing, with one in particular that I would like to concentrate on here, the element of the pause, or what I am naming here as waiting. It is a very rare device deployed by solo improvisers, and it is one that announces the voice of Steve Lacey distinctly for me. The common energy of the saxophone soloist at the time was a kind of packing in, or at least capitalizing on an opportunity. From Anthony Braxton to Peter Brotzman, Roscoe Mitchell, or Low Colksill, each had their own style that maximized the richness of their playing in each piece. Evan Parker's, Evan Parker's circular breathing, for instance, allowed him to minimize pausing in his solo playing so much that at times, in a 20 minute long solo, we may hear only two split seconds of breaks at best. Lacey, on the other hand, uses the pause, not just as a space to breathe before the next run of notes, but instead lets the pause sink in before a brief moment uh, to needle its way between intention and action. It's enough time to charge his playing with a sense of anticipation but also confusion around why it's there. That moment becomes ripe with all sorts of meaning embedded in the act of waiting, the waiting for, the waiting on, the waiting with. And we could finish these phrases in a number of ways, but always operating as a check or a catch of intention, a reminder that there's options to the rules, an alternative way out of the game, the game of aesthetics, of right and wrong, of appropriate and vulgar. Together, his solo recordings make for an awkward avant-garde that runs counter to our expectations of one's display of technical prowess and traditional competence. Each squeak, stutter, phrase, and melody feel vulnerable, sitting between rudiment and curiosity, learning and exploration. Whether he's playing a monk composition or a total free improvisation, Lacey's pauses are, are present. They sit there, even ever so brief and wait. They offer up a type of participation with the listener that very few improvisers have been able to make room for. And it's about reserving space. To name that space would be foolish. It really is playing that which can't be played, the future. And it, a quote from Steve Lacey in an interview with Roberto Terlizzi from 1976 about his solo playing. He says, it's a different story to group music because it's one voice. You have to control very carefully your material. You can't bore people. You must hold their interest. You must keep the whole space alive yourself. You have no drums, no help. You must keep the thing alive by the change of material. And that was a challenge for me to organize my material so that I could keep the interest alive with a single voice. I try to concentrate on rhythm, which is the most important element in a solo concert. In other words, rhythm for me is when you do something and what you do afterwards and the distance between and the proportions. Rhythm is the most difficult thing in solo concerts and also the sound, because it's based on sound and no sound. That's all you have in solo performances. And so I'd like to play uh, just as a way of giving you an example of the sonic qualities of Steve Lacey's playing in relation to um, someone like Evan Parker. I'll play a brief one minute section of an Evan Parker piece from 1975. And then I'll play uh, one full piece from Steve Lacey called Cloudy from an Eminem Records um, album called Wheel and Woe. Uh, and it's about three minutes long. So here's Evan Parker. <laughs> Oh, my God. 
Steve Lacey with Cloudy from Wheel and Woe, 1974. Thanks. Thank you, Matt um, and Jane, um, for these very yeah. Ex as Ritz said in the beginning, these these um, presentations that are really opening the sonic dimension of waiting um, with these very rich. Uh, looks at different aspects of waiting and, and who and listening and who and what we're waiting for and listening to. Um, before we, before we, if anyone wants to start putting questions in, please feel free. Um, but I'd like to invite Matt and Jane if you'd like to respond to each other. I know Matt, you said you had a few questions, or Jane, if you had any for Matt um, to get us started. Can I start, perhaps? Sure. Um, I, I really enjoyed that, Matt. I, I thought that was excellent. And, and I love the idea of this generative pause, you know, somehow that this space 
is um, from which from is the place from which sound unfurls somehow. You know that there's a sort of um, unfurling and, and growth from the space, and I, I just feel it. You know, we our projects are very complementary. Um, mm. That my whole project, sort of this work, came from a, you know, lockdown and inf illness and an inf enforced sort of pausing that has sort of generated all sorts of stuff, and I. I could just hear that in in the music of um, Steve Lacey that you played. I thought mm. that was great. Really enjoyed it. Thanks. Yeah, I, I mean, there's something that I think also, I didn't really get to get at it in the text, but it's what I find uh, also so incredibly paradoxical about Steve Lacey's pausing is that he's playing you know, that the pause is him playing. Yeah. It's not a breath, it's not a, it's not a waiting in the traditional sense of like, what's to come next, you know, that, um, but what he's playing is a listener's projection of what might come uh, as he's, as he's not playing <laughs> to, as the best way to put it, I guess, you know, and I, uh, I like to think in it, it's similar, but also completely different than like thinking about Cage's 433 in the sense that yeah. it's composed, it's strategized. So like in 433, even though there's no actual piano playing, there's actually no room for silence because everything is so packed in. It's it's a way of composing as much as possible at any given moment. And, and I think Lacey does this, he's just, because it's positioned in free improvisation, and jazz and a space of expression that's singular to the individual, I think it becomes really complicated when, when that stop happens. The stop of like blowing his horn, for instance. Um, but maybe uh, also Jane, like um, something that I would, I, I really liked your presentation and I always think it, it reminds me of these, these sort of ways that um, culturally we talk about, well, like uh, I've heard a number of times that Bach is really good for plants, you know, for some reason, like, and then I wonder, but but then if we listen to like Maris Bell, is that also good for plants or is that a major problem? Like what is Bach versus a wall of sound in relation to plants and their responsiveness? Um, or putting headphones on a pregnant woman's stomach and that the baby is somehow like responding to those, those tones and it conditions the kind of listening. Um, and I just think something that I was thinking about in, in your project is the filter. And that seems to be like such a dilemma and, and like an interesting problem, you know, that there's, there's the filter of the microphone that processes things and there's the filter of how you hear it through through like you I think you said you use garage band um maybe and you know all sorts of other mediations that uh le make me wonder about like this question of purity in in relation to audio experience yes and I think you know with the plant sound there isn't really a purity at all it's all translation you know, it's all um, this, this, this sounds that are set up that you select. But within that, there is this modulation that, the, that somehow the plant generates. And I, I was initially a little bit um, cynical myself and wondered if, you know, it was my rhythms that were raising, sort of altering the tones. But, mm. you know, I think having done it a little bit, you can feel the the tones adjust, the plant calm down. You know, if it was just my rhythms, they'd carry on being the same, but there's definitely a, a response. Um, I had thought, you know, when I was first proposing this, that I might do a live performance, but the problem is, you know, you sort of have to squeeze quite hard and then the plant gets a bit bored and doesn't really play. And then, you know, what do I do? Do I tear a leaf to get a good sound? You know, it's sort of ethically problematic, I think. So 
but I, th I think for me, so much of the sort of um, audio stuff is is just generate um, or focused towards human sound, human voice, microphones, human hearing, and it's getting to that other other stuff. I think that is interesting. Mm. Um, the other other worlds of sound. Well, and especially the connection point that the sound that you, if I heard you right, that the sound is coming from is 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 bound to flow. It's from something flowing as, as uh, uh, opposed to the sound of, of static. Um, yeah. and, and how that, can, that, that correlation when you positioning this within the framework of waiting, I feel a little bit like I'm supposed to be talking about waiting, um, but maybe I'll bring that back around. But um, this idea of, of waiting and flow uh, and and are they are they opposed or is there is there a way that one can have waiting within flow um, or or is it just is waiting bound by when flow stops? I have a quick interjection which I think is related and it's a question from um, Titus Abbott in the audience who says did Polly ha ever have moments of silence while the MIDI patches were attached? I'm curious about that. Yes, and yes, there is silence. And it's sort of like, if I'd known more about Steve Lacey and Matt's paper beforehand, I, I, you know, I tended to discount the silence, which is interesting. I, I was trying to capture the sound. Mm -hmm. um, but no, there is definitely a silence and you sort of need to wake her up a little bit to get some sound going. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I think it's, she would burble away in the background in the daytime and then there would be patches of science and then she'd pick up again. Um, but I, I think I like this idea of flow and I, you, you know, the sound coming from the flow in the plant, but breathing is also a form of flow, isn't it? You know, you're, you know, in terms of Steve Lacey's, you know, the, the pause being breath or breathing or some sort of exchange in that sense, I think, too, which is quite interesting. Mm -hmm. One question that um, I think came up in, in some ways in Matt's presentation, and I kind of share it in a way in your presentation too, or in your discussion about it, Jane, is this question around um, participation or audience, you know? Um, in Matt's presentation, Matt, you asked uh, who is the solo impro improviser improvising with or for, for that matter, mm -hmm. right? So there's a kind of this question around perhaps the system um, uh, of education, of upbringing, of culture, um, or the audience. In the case of Jane, I, I think, and you keep talking about how you had to touch Polly um, for for her to kind of generate a sound, let's say, uh, a response. And so it, it's again, a kind of, um, I don't know if we would call it improvisation or what, what form of communication it is. Um, but in both cases, there's a kind of relational aspect to um, the production of sound or silence for that matter. Um, and I'm, um, interested in sh sharing a bit more about that. I'd quite like to extend, I haven't got there yet, but I'd like to extend the sound and, and see hook up multiple plants because I, I would think that they are capable of, you know, communicating sound between each other that we don't hear. Um, so that maybe there is this background vibration. Um, I know certainly, you know, there's lots of stuff to do with trees and roots and mycelium being a sort of internet form of communication that this flow of, you know, liquids or is is being played as it were, continuously as, a, as an environment. Um, 
Yeah, because in, in both cases, it feels almost like there's an, and maybe I'm misspeaking here, but there, there's a, a sort of a sound or a silence, a kind of flow that is withdrawn, that mm. it's always already there. In yes. the case of Matt's presentation, it might be this notion of the system, whatever that is, uh, that there's already a sort of a set of things in motion. What the musician, the improviser, the MIDI <laughs> uh, is doing is uh, extracting, um, making visible, making audible something that is already present. Um, and mm -hmm. I wonder if you think about that in terms of Steve Lacey's music too, Matt. Yeah, definitely. Um, maybe before I respond to that, I had a question for you about that term relational. Mm -hmm. Like when you're talking about relational, I mean, I'm think, um, hmm. I'm what I'm hearing from you is like a relationalness that is not grounded in power relations, but a, re a relationalness that is just like a fundamental exchange for the for the survival of whether it's the sonic qualities the music the life of the player or the plant um that there there's a kind of that the life or the survival uh depends on this relationalness and it could be the audience it could be history it could be all these things but that they all play their role in order to maintain this thing to keep going. Is that what you mean by relational? Um, I guess I mean that in the way that any, any form of utterance is um, in relation to not just the person who's making the utterance or the, in this case, the plant, but um, also those who are present to receive it. And this might be other plants, this might be the soil, this might be people in the audience. So um, yeah, so I guess in a sort of broad way. Um, I wanted to maybe pull in a couple of uh, comments and questions that have come in. Um, Jackie says, the first sax example in Matt's presentation sounded like breathing is the baseline. Is this so? Um, and, and then Titus Abba says, as a sac so soprano saxophonist, I wanted to point out that almost all the notes in Lacey's solo are in the range above the note range of the saxophone, altissimo, very challenging to achieve. There's bravery, bravery involved in choosing so much silence separated by notes that are very difficult um, to be sure will speak clearly. Um, and I, I think I'll just throw in the third question as well, and then you can decide whether to respond or how to respond. Uh, Diego Gerard asks a question to both of you. Is there a way to define silence? If we are relating waiting to silence, wouldn't it be more accurate to say that waiting lies in the lingering aspects of sound, as opposed to silence, I suppose, which is a kind of um, absence? That's a lot. That's a lot, sorry. <laughs> um, and they're also unrelated. Like I, I think maybe there were two comments and one question. The question is mm. the one about silence mm. versus lingering aspects of sound in relation. Could I, could I speak to that? Because I'm not sure there is a thing. I'm not sure science is a thing, you yeah. know? Yeah. Um, I think it's less sound and it's how you listen to it. You know, it's how you frame it and use it you know if we're talking about a generative pause or you know listening to to attend to something it's it's an active space for me i think yeah i would totally agree with that uh, I, i'm in i kept catching myself in writing this thinking about lacy using the silence and i'm like wait that's ridiculous there's not only is he not, there's no silence involved, but also that I'm not 100% sure silence exists. It's like, in theory, it's a way of describing things that are different. Um, but, uh, sorry, I'm not sure where I was going with that. Maybe I was just agreeing with you, Jane. <laughs> Could I also add that it's it's a sort of very, um, 
anthropocentric view, you know, mm-hmm. that, you know, that actually there's all this other stuff going around that we're just not listening to or, and, but we're, we're saying it silence, you know, we're negating it somehow. Yeah. The, I'm, I mean, John Cage is such an icon. Like I hate to keep bringing him up because I sound so cliche, but I do want to say that there's a brief moment where he's reading something during his indeterminacy recordings. Uh, and he's talking about uh, this moment of going into um, a sensory deprivation chamber and yeah. losing all of the audio and then wondering what that high pitched hum was. And he came out and they said, that's your blood flowing through your body. And mm-hmm. I think that, that 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 is precisely maybe correlated to what you're getting at, Jane, with the plants is, is that in order for there to be flow, in order for there to be exchange, like there's sound that will fundamentally be tied to that if we just listen. Um, and listening to the flow versus listening for the thing that's played, that to me, that's the fundamental difference. Like I always talk about like to my students when, we're, when I'm teaching painting, the question of like uh, looking versus seeing, you know, and that seeming is an act, seeing is an act of naming the things that you're looking at, but looking is a process and it allows your body to be responsive to whatever is in front of you. Um, maybe not to jump ahead or to get, uh, to address those two comments writ that you read earlier, um, Titus, I just want to say thank you for pointing that out about Steve Lacey's playing because many people think that he's uh, just not a good soprano saxophone player um, because of the tones that he's getting. Uh, but yes, they're incredibly difficult um, and uh, especially to do it and and use the and do it in the way that he's doing it. It's very awkward. It's very tense. Um, and I find that really productive to be in that space with him when he's playing that way, um, sonically. Uh, and then, and then the, I just want to say the example of Evan Parker, um, I chose that specifically just because it was recorded roughly around the same time or within like the year, year and a half of Steve Lacey. Uh, I felt like a, a kind of time moment of landing them together was important. And, but I do want to say uh, Evan, Evan Parker's playing, I love it, and it's really complicated in his own right, but he sort of started to become known for like circular breathing and hitting these pitch harmonics that would like feed into one another, and it almost got to the point where it sounds like sometimes you're hearing three or four saxophone players playing at one time. It's pretty immense. Um, in the example I, I played tonight, uh, it's, it's very early on in his uh, like developing of his language around the saxophone. So you definitely heard a lot of breath. It's very breathy, but it's also very physical. Um, And I think if I had to draw a distinction, which I don't like to do between Lacey and Parker, but I'm only doing it here because there's such extreme different examples. um, I would say Lacey's Lacey's playing is very theoretical and Parker's playing is very bodily in a certain sense. In another sense, that doesn't make any sense. So I'll just say that, <laughs> yeah. Um, there's a question from the audience uh, from Jake Barber, but before getting to it, I actually have a question for Jane, which is, um, I mean, I was really interested in what you said about, um, I guess you were talking about Eduardo Cohn's How uh, Forest Think, um, and he, where he says, by not naming something, um, in some ways, we render it killable, um, and uh, which was a, a sort of an argument for anthropomorphizing um, others, other beings, as a way to make them um, part of the we, let's say. And so I think there's this ethical aspect to this listening that you're talking about, um, because it's, as you said, to listen to is to, to act. Yeah. Um, and... Um, and I would love to hear more about that. Um, how, how, what is this ethics of listening and how has it affected you? Um, it feels like this kind of uh, gardening and <laughs> recording plants is perhaps a, a new uh, practice for you. And I'm mm. curious how that's affected you. 
Yes, I think um, I sort of feel, <laughs> I, I mean, uh, I sort of feel I'm being trained by Polly to take on board these sounds and somehow being schooled in thinking about what to do with them. Um, I'm fairly early on in this work, so it'll be interesting to see where it goes. But it's sort of that realization that you can hear sounds that are other than human produced. Um, I'm, I'm interested in, in what that means, really, I guess. I'm not an audio specialist. I'm not, you know, a, a botanist, but I'm interested in the implications of that. Um, and what that would mean then in terms of relationships. You know, my previous work was all about our relationships with materials and, you know, it's our relationships with plants. How, if you can hear a plant singing like this, you know, and it, how, how can you possibly let it die? You know, how can you mistreat it? Um, which was, you know, to circle back to the ethics of doing a live performance. It was a bit, you know, suspect, I think. But I, I think it's really sort of, um, I walk around parks thinking, oh, you know, if I could hook up this plant, what would that sound like, you know? Um, so I think, and I don't, the other side of this is I don't want to be too techno-positive about it because, you know, this is giving me a window onto other beings' communication. But really I think it's circling around it back to forms of indigenous wisdom that have been you know present across the globe for centuries but you know through western technology we're sort of catching up a bit um which is interesting but i don't i you know i don't want to present it as a sort of technical answer to anything really you know jane do you um in order for Polly to make sound, um, like if you turned a fan onto it, would would sound start to be produced? Does it require like touch and friction for that no. sound to happen? It doesn't. Mm. So when you turn the lights off, that also is enough to shift the sound. Is that right? Um, no, I just selected a different sort of sample for the for the nighttime one. That was I was there were different samples I was using. No, she she will make sounds. She alters her sounds when I touch her, though. I see. So she gets, I suspect she gets anxious. Mm. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> and it, it's, and this is the anthropomorphizing again, you know, the, the pitch goes, ah! you know. <laughs> but then she goes, oh, 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 you know, and then it sort of flattens out again. So, Hmm. You know, so it was a sort of duet because I was sort of holding holding her. But I don't want to stress her too much, you know. And then after a while, if I keep trying to do recordings and, oh, I'll try a different sample, I'll try a different sample. She doesn't want to play, you know, she gets bored of it, really, so. And this might be a really ignorant question, but... Um... I'm just wondering if uh, a stethoscope is powerful enough to catch that sound? No. No, I, and I've been playing around with contact mics um, on different surfaces, trying to take this back into materials. Mm. And, you know, I, contact mics won't work, you know, so other things, it, it, the, the MIDI sprout is, is sort of adjusted to plant vibrations. Mm. Um, mm. But you can put one of those things on your own, on yourself. You know, I've put it on my neck and recorded the flow of my own blood to go mm. back to John Cage, you know. Mm. So that's quite interesting. Mm. Mm. Um, um, there, there are some questions that could also, I'll, I'll just read them out. You, you can answer them or not. Uh, one is uh, how, from Jay Farber, how might Polly's song singing shift with change, for example, of seasons or window or food, water or other changes. Um, Efrat Lipkin says, uh, asks Jane, what is your relationship to land art? Is your interest in the sound of nature urban? Great questions. And thank you, Jake. Jake's a colleague. 
<laughs> so um, I, I do, I think the sound is better and more active if I water poly. So I think giving liquids and things like that increase sort of sound and energy and activity in poly. Um, I, I haven't tried in different seasons particularly yet because it's I haven't had that sort of longitudinal time with this um so I don't really know but I, th I think water and sustenance is is one of the key things that affects her yeah certainly um I don't have a lot of links with land art really I mean I, I'm a very aware of it having taught sculpture and stuff so I'm aware of it but I, I I'm sort of in a you know you get locked into fields so I've been working in a design materials field more so um, but it's you know it would be great to go out and take this equipment across forests and and I'll do it on a bigger scale certainly um I'm going to just chime in a little to, we're towards the end of our time. So if anyone also wants to put in a last question, let us know. It's been really nice just to kind of listen to the back and forth. Um, and I want to put in, there's another comment um, from Nancy A. Uh, just remarking that in the Manhur, Italy, an independent community has been experimenting with consciousness of plants since 1975. I don't know if you know this project and created a music of the plants device with similar technology. Um, and it, they put it on various plants and forests. And she's uh, the, the the questioner or commenter. Nancy has also been experimenting with plants for years. It seems like there is there is a lot of um, yeah. I mean, I, and I think I read the the overstory that did a lot of this, and I was just watching mm -hmm. Embrace of the Serpent. Yeah, so there's a lot of kind of interesting art and and film being made about this. Um, as you said, something that's been known by humanity on and off in different forms for for long times and lost and regained. And, um, as you're both, I mean, this is, I guess, just a kind of comment as you were speaking, it's funny to me because I think in a moment of seclusion or, or loneliness, as a lot of people in some ways are fortunate to be experiencing now, not having to, to be out every day, but um, there is this kind of, I think of monastic, I think of this kind of remove from society and this openness to other kinds of expression or experience and, you know, Matt talking about John Cage, um, and, and Jane kind of this tapping into plants and other forms of consciousness. There's this kind of mystical element that was that was coming up in the presentations, which seems somewhat of, of our moment. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of kind of vague spirituality floating out there, but what I was interested in in both of your presentations, and I don't know if this speaks to what you're, you think in your self-reflexive uh, position on your work, but um, that this isn't, you know, sometimes I think we think of mysticism as timelessness or as perfection, non-duality. And it seemed like what you were tapping into was, was that mysticism was a kind of another form of the world that, that we live, right? That it was not timeless, but in fact had its own rhythms of time um, and not silent, but had just kind of different sounds that maybe we don't always hear and not perfect, right? But as complex, perhaps as brutal as, as everyday life. And I, I was just kind of curious if, if something... I know, Jane, you started by talking about how this had come out of your COVID time, but is there something specific in, in this moment, this kind of, this waiting separation that you think has opened this, or is this a continuity uh, for either or both of you with, with the kind of what you've been doing, um, you know, for your, for your careers? Mm. Jane, you want to take that first? Okay. Um, I think I would I would not have made this set of work if I hadn't forcibly been stopped by COVID and had to, the lockdown. So I think, you know, in in terms of a a pause in playing my life, as it were, you know, this has been very generative, um, and I, th I think you get a sort of clarity sometimes when you stop and there's not too so much noise around it's a bit I guess there's a sort of meditational element where things clear the, the water clears and you see things a little bit clearer 
And I would say certainly that has been my experience of this pausing and enabled me to sort of produce different things, which has been refreshing, I think. Mm. I mean, I, I can, I can say uh, maybe, Avi, I'm not, um, I'm not a, you talk about the mysticism in a past tense. So I'm just, I feel like you're speaking about it in a, a historical place. Um, and I'm, if that's the case, I, I would only say like, I'm not sure I know what that place is that you're spe you're referring to, whether it's in philosophy or um, social theory or what have you, but, but I just would say like, I lately it just feels like the only answer is just to keep my mouth shut like <laughs> that what what have I got to say that's not already like clear in my head or clear as a problem or clear as a solution and if we just it, it was this moment during it was definitely this moment during the beginning of the lockdown that they started sort of reading the reports of because the whole world nearly was locked down, that like, um, that the slowness of the destruction environmentally of the world was actually shifting. Like we could see like 3% shift in those like three months that like the world had locked itself down. And, and it just, it was, it was clear, like in order to get to some answers, like people just need to quit speaking need to quit, we need to quit filling space and and just like configure ourselves according to, uh, for me at least, for a number of reasons, just keeping my mouth shut. And 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 that, that also brought me to Steve Lacey uh, for a number of reasons. Um, and, and I keep going back to that work. So uh, I guess, all that's to say, I don't know, in my world, like mysticism is tied to a kind of belief structure or a kind of um, hope or truth or commitment to a certain way of being. And I don't know if I have that. Um, I don't know if I'm there, but I do know that the systems that I've relied on my whole life don't seem to function anymore. Um, and I definitely don't trust them. So it seems like the best move is to just stop for a second. I think, um, yeah, I had a, sorry, I was using a somewhat vague, you know, mysticism as a, as a general term. I, I appreciate your specificity there. As you were speaking, I also thought of the, you know, Cage, when he talks about the origin of 433, he says it's this essay he wrote in high school, and it's, a, it's like a foreign policy essay, and they say, you know, what, um, what should the United States do with respect to Latin America? And he says, you know, shut up and listen. Mm. Um, and that this was kind of the idea for 433, that it was, that it had, you know, it's often written off as kind of apolitical, but actually had this real origin in exactly what you're saying, that there's this kind of time to, to open up and that um, in the pause that, that things can emerge, uh, the voices of other peoples or consciousnesses or elements or, or nations um, when people take that time. Mm. Um, that's a really, I, I really appreciate that thought and, and that connection here. Mm. Um, I, yeah. But there's just one, um, Nick Ferguson just also says, thank you all, um, and that they enjoyed listening. Uh, sorry, I thought there was a question, so I started reading. Um, <laughs> thank you, Nick, for listening. <laughs> does any, do I, does, I don't know, Jane or, or Matt, um, we're sort of over our time, but do, do either of you have any kind of closing thoughts that you would like to put out there, or we can, the rest can be silence, as they. You know, I, I don't feel I can say anything after Matt's call to silence. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can say I'm going to go try and listen to my plants now, Jane, that's for sure. Uh, well, thank you all so much. I wish we had the opportunity to listen to the audience and to everyone else out there. Um, but we thank everyone for your virtual presence and Jane and Matt for these really um, evocative and, and inspiring presentations. Um, I feel inspired to listen to everything. Yeah. Um, so thanks all to, um, thanks to, again, to MIT, um, CAC, I said CCA, or CAC for putting this um, together. Uh, and to you guys for coming. And our next event again is um, February 18th with Jonathan, uh, Jonathan Van Dyke and Tarane Fazeli. Uh, and Ritz, I don't know if we need to, anything else?
No, uh, thank you both so much. Uh, this, this has opened so many questions that I'll keep thinking about. Yeah, likewise. Yeah, thank you. All right. Good, Good night, night, everyone. Good night.